this morning continuing the story of the birth narrative of Jesus Christ. We, we will be in chapter 1, verses 26 to 38 today, if you want to turn there, or you can follow along on the slides. By way of introduction, I want us to think for a moment about the changing nature of messages. We have so many options for messages today. We've got text messages, although I've never sent one. I hear, hear people do that all the time. Uh, instant messages, we've got voicemails and emails. Uh, there, a few years ago, it was a big deal when we had faxes. And believe it or not, I remember a time when none of those existed. Some of you young people probably think that's crazy, but it's true. It wasn't that long ago. Before that, there were letters and things like the Pony Express and the Telegraph. And then you go back to a time before that when basically messages had to be delivered in person. Messages have had an impact on history. Three quick ones to mention, two of which are American history. It's little known that Robert E. Lee had his orders written out and they were intercepted because one of his messengers dropped them. And that led in part to the victory at the Battle of Antietam and the uh, Emancipation Proclamation that happened after that. It was a message that went astray. And a lot of other people don't know that the Battle of New Orleans in the War of 1812 was actually fought two weeks after the war ended. The peace treaty had already been signed, but of course nobody was able to get a message all the way to New Orleans in time. And probably one of the most famous messages in history happened in 490 BC. If that doesn't pique your interest, you're thinking 490 BC, what happened then? That was following the victory of the city of Athens over the armies of Imperial Persia on the plains of, uh, excuse me, on the battlefield of a place known as Marathon. Perhaps now it rings a bell. A young man named uh, Phidippides ran from the battlefield all the way to Athens with the news, and legend has it that he said but one word, Nike, which you might not know means victory. In other words, we won. He collapsed and he died. Now that's a message that will be long remembered in its drama, and that's where we get the distance, more or less, for the modern day marathon, was the amount of space he was said to have covered. We're going to talk today about a different message and a different messenger. We're going to look at the angel Gabriel coming to Mary. So let's begin in verse 26 of the first chapter. It says, In the sixth month, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee. We are told first that it was in the sixth month. There we go. Sorry, I've got a lot of feedback from that. In the sixth month. That is six months into the pregnancy of Elizabeth that we talked about last week, Zechariah and Elizabeth. So now we have John, the forerunner of the Messiah, the one who will carry on in the spirit and power of Elijah. He's about to be born. Just a few short months from now, he will enter the world. We are told that once again, Gabriel is the messenger. It is obvious that these events that Luke is describing are part of the providential plan of God. His hand is on this scenario. God is the one who chose Zechariah and Elizabeth to be the parents of John and made that miracle happen. Now he's about to make the next phase of his plan known. And again, this very angel who stands in the presence of God in heaven is the messenger. Now this message which he is about to give, like the last one, is bound to be important. Whatever phase two or the sequel or whatever you want to call it for God's plan is, it has to be bigger than the phase one, that miraculous birth of John. How do you talk a birth that was announced by Gabriel in the temple itself? And yet we hear that he's going to Nazareth. And here's where the expected show-stopping story seems to fall apart. Because John's parents lived just outside of Jerusalem in one of the suburbs, as it were. The center of worship and administration for the people of Israel, the heart and soul of Israel is Jerusalem. Nazareth couldn't be more the opposite of Jerusalem if it tried. If Jerusalem is the center, then Nazareth is the far corner, the kind of place you can't see from here. 
It's over there somewhere. If Jerusalem is urban sophistication, where all of the trends and happening people are, then Nazareth is a rustic backwater. Whoever the angel is heading out to meet, the audience might assume that they must not be very important. Certainly not in the eyes of those who run things. Why else would they live, live in Nazareth? As Nathaniel would later say in the Gospel to Philip, what, excuse me, Nazareth, can anything good come from there? Had no reputation at all. Let's continue with the text. Verse 27 says this, To a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David, the virgin's name was Mary. Now we hear that the angel went to a virgin pledged to be married. The first half of that should be redundant and unnecessary. The law of Moses made it crystal clear that both man and woman must refrain from sexual union prior to marriage. The only exception to this would be if we had a widow or a widower involved who was now remarried. So to say that this soon-to-be bride is indeed a virgin is to indicate both her youth, otherwise she would have been married by now, and this would be the case of her remarrying, and her character, because she has indeed followed the law of Moses and has a good reputation. Now we are told that she is pledged, and the pledge itself is far more serious than our period of engagement that we have in our society before people are married. It didn't, it didn't involve only the potential bride and bridegroom. Nowadays, when someone gets married, it's the groom asking the bride. If he's real traditional, he asks his future father-in-law's permission. But that's usually pretty formal. It's not a contract. It's not a serious thing. It's almost unheard of for the, father, the potential father-in-law to say, no, you can't ask him. Maybe someone knows of such a circumstance happening, but it's pretty rare. But in this case, both families, and especially the fathers, would have been the ones that made this agreement. It was more than simply the union of two people. It was an economic decision where the future groom would have to demonstrate to the bride's father that he could provide for her. And it often involved some sort of financial compensation by the bride's father to the new family, what's known as a dowry. So it's a big deal. And lastly, it was not an agreement that either party could walk away from. If you broke the betrothal, you had to have a divorce. Just the same as any consummated marriage would be. You had to actually get divorced to break the engagement. So it's a serious thing. We're told that the angel came to Nazareth to a woman who was to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. And so we hear that and we say, so this must be the guy. This must be the guy who's important enough for a visit from Gabriel. Well, he's got the proper lineage at least. He's a direct descendant of Israel's, Israel's greatest king, David. But on the other hand, the family of David has not sat on the so-called throne of David for more than 500 years. It's a long time for a claim to a throne to be dormant. That's twice as, more than twice as long as America's been around. That nobody sat on that throne for a long time. Even knowing that there were some nationalists who wanted to resurrect that David kingdom, Davidic kingdom, who wanted it back, provided, of course, that you know, the overlordship of Rome could be done away with, no big deal. It would have been far, far from certain that Joseph would have been their choice for the job. After all, he isn't living anywhere near the ancestral family town of Bethlehem. He isn't even living in the tribal lands of Judah. He's living far to the north in this little book of town of Nazareth. There must have been plenty of other cousins and uncles and nephews, even brothers of Joseph, who would have been a more natural choice, even among his own clan, if they were to pick the one they wanted to inherit the throne. And we know 
know from other texts that Joseph's a carpenter. That's an honest day's work. That's hard work. But it's by no means glamorous. And it is certainly not likely to make you rich or give you power. How is this man going to be the right one? It seems as if Gabriel is either choosing the wrong guy or God is once again looking beyond the surface qualities to see the heart of the matter. And it reminds us, that's just what he did when Samuel anointed David to be king. He bypassed all of David's older and taller brothers to pick him. Now we're also told that the virgin's name was Mary. In typical patriarchal fashion, that's all we hear about her. We don't know about her family, we don't know about her background, that's it. Society was considering the fact that she was indeed a virgin to be the most important qualification for her marriage to go forward. We're told about Joseph's connection to David because any future children this pair may have will be reckoned through his ancestry and not hers. So at this point, it's safe to say that a first century audience would be curious as to why God would send his angel Gabriel to meet a backwater carpenter and his pledged young future bride. Now don't let the elevated status of Mary and Joseph now obscure the fact that they were quite ordinary then. They were just two people among many. Nothing setting them out on the surface at least as special. Let's look at the message itself, verses 28 and 29. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. Now here we see once again something interesting. The angel went to her. Once again, the story is going in an unexpected direction. We were just told who Joseph was, who his family was, who his ancestor was, his connection to everybody's hero, David, and the angel ignores him and goes to her instead. Not exactly culturally what you would expect. What kind of message would he be bringing that would be for her and not for him? And why is it important that Gabriel came before the marriage take, took place? Let's look at the message. He said to her, Greetings, you who are highly favored, the Lord is with you. Unlike Zechariah, this time Gabriel doesn't give the recipient of his message time to react with fear, but he starts right away with a message. And what a message it is. This is the kind of salutation we would expect to hear if Mary were a queen, instead of just a young girl living in a small middle of the nowhere village. Greetings, you who are highly favored. Certainly sounds like a good thing to be highly favored by God, doesn't it? The kind of thing that would result in a tremendous blessing coming next. The kind of thing that you would say about someone who's going to be integral to the plan of God. But what makes Mary the choice, and not any other woman who had or would soon marry into Joseph's extended family? There must have been dozens of them. We know very little, actually about either Mary or Joseph, in all honesty. What we learn from is their response to this unprecedented, unprecedented situation, which will indicate for us that they were both not only mature, but of high moral character. You see, the qualities they possessed were not on the outside, but on the inside. And they are not necessarily visible to anybody but the Lord. In addition, we are told in this passage that the Lord is with you. That's nice to know. Because we know that the Lord promises to be with his people, plural, with the people of God as a whole. But to know that he is with you as an individual as well would certainly inspire confidence and obedience on the part of whoever hears it. And yet, you see this, Mary was greatly troubled at his words. And that should seem odd to us. The angel Gabriel has just given Mary a highly positive greeting, full of assurance that God's intention toward her is favorable. He even said highly favorable. So why the turmoil on her part? Actually, 
Hesitation is a common response when an angel or God himself speaks directly to man. People ask themselves, wait a minute, what's God up with me? Why me? Why is, he, why is he talking to me? They wonder, what kind of task am I going to give him? If God's talking to me, he must want me to do something. And they get nervous about that. Moses is the prime example. We think of Moses as the mighty leader part of the Red Sea and carrying the Ten Commandments and all that. But one of the very first things Moses said after God appeared to him is, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh? And he spent as much time as he could trying to get God to send someone else. The same could be said of Jonah, who actually took it to the end degree and he ran away. Said, Not me. God brought him back. We saw the same thing from Esther, who when, saw, when she saw the opportunity, basically said, thanks, but no thanks. And later, she turned around and accepted God's plan for her role. So Mary's reluctance, Mary's concern, is not unusual. Perhaps with Mary, the reaction is simply that she has never considered herself to be the kind of person that God would want to send an angel to. If your own expectations are not that high, it can be frightening to realize that God is envisioning great things for you. Your own self-doubt gets in the way. You see, we see more clearly who we are than who we can be. We have a hard time with who we can be. Yet God has no trouble seeing both who we are now and who he can make us into. Let's continue with the message, verses 30 to 33. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found a favor with God. You will be with child and give birth to a son. And you are to give him the name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of God, the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. The first thing the angel says to Mary is, you will be with child and give birth to a son. Now if Gabriel had appeared to Mary a few months later, after her marriage to Joseph, this would have been worthy of celebration hearing this. It would have been a normal thing, but certainly something worth saying, awesome, great, we're going to have a son. But as it is, at this point in her life, talk of a child will only make Mary's confusion grow. She's told you are to give him the name Jesus. Well, that at least is not that big of a deal, not cause for alarm. The name Jesus is simply the Greek form of the common Hebrew name Yeshua that you probably know more by its common pronunciation, Joshua. Well, that's a name we're familiar with. Being told that your kid's going to be named basically Joshua is not that big a deal. He's a hero after all. Then, you know, the Battle of Jericho and all that. We know Joshua. That's a good name. So Mary wouldn't have been taken aback by that too much. Whether it's Jesus or Yeshua or Joshua, it means the same thing. It means the Lord is salvation. In other words, it means God saves. A fitting name for anyone who is a follower of the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. The angel says, he will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. Well, the first part of that is obvious. If this child wasn't going to be special, Gabriel wouldn't have come to announce his impending birth. He would have been born like everybody else. Of course he's got to have a big role in the will of God if he's been announced this way. If he's going to be great, God's got plans for him. So there's nothing unusual about that. He will be great. The second part, though, the second part is mystifying. It must have made Mary's growing confusion take another leap upward. Her first question would have been this. Uh, why is my kid not going to be called the son of Joseph? Now well, that's, that's a problem, is it? Is Gabriel saying that this marriage isn't going to happen? Is she predicting that he's going, that this betrothal is going to be broken? I mean, that's, that's bad. And her second question right after that is going to be, wait a minute. Most High, Son of the Most High. That's a clear reference to God Himself. How could any Son of Mary be called such a thing? Maybe she's thinking, wait a minute, is this some sort of metaphor, right? Maybe God's going to adopt Him, kind of like how Eli raised Samuel at the tabernacle. 
So he's going to be called, you know, with quotation marks, the Son of the Most High, right? Right? But if not that, then what could it possibly be? The angel Gabriel doesn't give Mary a chance to process any of that information because here comes another thing for her to think about. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. Well, that's not necessarily going to take a miracle. Joseph is of the family of David, after all, but it is going to take something that nobody thinks is possible. It's not a miracle, it's just impossible. Because you're going to have to defeat Rome to set any child on the throne of David. You see, the empire of Rome has no interest in a Davidic descendant sitting on the throne of Israel. That sort of king is all too likely to want independence for his people. And that's not something Rome is willing to give. They're happy with the guy they got sitting on the throne right now. You might have heard of him. His name's Herod. He's perfect. He's a bought and paid for puppet on their behalf. And he will gladly take care of anyone who tries to subvert his rule. And behind it, the overlordship of Rome. They got the guy on the throne. They won already. So you say, well, just drive him out. Just take Rome and throw him out and declare your independence. No big deal. There's one small problem with that. They rule nearly the whole known world. And nobody, nobody has stood up to Rome and succeeded. The ruins of Carthage speak about that. Once mighty Carthage is a wasteland now. And Previously, proud empires in Egypt and Greece are now dominated and demonstrate the improbability of a successful revolt. If they have been crushed, what hope for little Judea to stand up against Rome? So how will God make this promised son into a king? Is he going to be some mighty warrior, some amazingly brilliant general, better than any that have gone before, who is capable of overcoming those odds? Gabriel says he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. You might be thinking, surely this is hyperbole, right? Gabriel is, you know, exaggerating. Nobody lives forever, and every kingdom certainly comes to an end eventually. Well, maybe Gabriel is referring to his descendants. In other words, he will metaphorically reign forever. Through his descendants, they will sit on the throne. But there is, however, a promise of God made to David himself that this prediction on Gabriel's part is connected to. 2 Samuel 7, 16 is God speaking to David. It says this, Your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. Now, skeptics living in the time of Mary and Joseph may have considered this promise to be void. After half a millennia, they might have a point. It's been a long time. Yet we know that the promises that God makes are unbreakable. Is he about to reestablish David's throne in keeping with that promised covenant? Mary has just one issue with this prediction, verse 34. Uh, how would this be, Mary asked the angel, since I'm a virgin? Just one small problem with the plan. Mary may be just a young village girl, uh, but she understands that something is missing in this puzzle. You see, of all the miraculous births, Sarah had Abraham, Hannah had Elkanah, and Elizabeth, her cousin, had Zechariah. Mary doesn't have Joseph yet. Not quite yet. They're not married yet. She sees a problem. Something that needs to be done with that. Verse 35. The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One will be born will be called the Son of God. She is told that the Holy Spirit and the power of the Most High will take care of this. What Gabriel is describing here would eventually be endlessly debated, and it still is, by theologians seeking to understand the Incarnation. What really happened here? What exactly is this saying? But on the surface, the meaning is clear enough. 
The child to be born will not be conceived by any normal process. Not by Joseph. Not by any man. You see, the Holy Spirit, a facet of God that has been largely in the background up until this point, will be the key mover, along with the power of God himself to do whatever the overshadowing means. We didn't really need to understand this process to accept that God did it. The child will be conceived, as it were, by God through the Holy Spirit. Needless to say, if Mary was confused before and a little concerned before, one would expect that she'd be speechless now. It says, the Holy One to be born to you will be called the Son of God. The end result of this situation, a child born of Mary, but no mere man. He will have a mother like we all have, flesh from flesh, but a father unlike any other, spirit from spirit. A son of God by the working of the Holy Spirit and God the Father. Now the need for such an extraordinary birth where God would take on human flesh is not going to be evident to Mary. There's no way she could understand why this had to happen. Nor would it be clear to anyone, including Mary, until she had stood at the foot of the cross. And until she had seen her son resurrected three days later. Only then would it be clear why this needed to happen. Gabriel offers her something in verse 37. He says, excuse me, 36 to 37. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she who was said to be barren is in her sixth month. For nothing is impossible with God. Gabriel uses Elizabeth as the example. The pregnancy of Elizabeth is proof to Mary that God isn't king around here. He's already made one miracle happen. And he reminds her, Mary, Elizabeth is your relative. She's not just some random stranger. She's somebody you know. You know that she was barren before. You know the years that that marriage went through with nothing as a result. And you know that she's pregnant. So he connects it to Mary to give her assurance and tells her nothing is impossible with God. Now that is a phrase that we are all too likely to cling to from time to time, especially when things in our life look bleak and hopeless. To Mary, it was assurance that Elizabeth's miracle was nothing to God. It didn't strain his power in the least. If he can do that, he can do this. A child of God is certainly more of a miracle if you can rank miracles. Miracles are miracles. They're all extraordinary. Yet God would not promise that which he cannot do. It is going to happen. One last verse for our passage today, verse 38. I am the Lord's servant, Mary said. May it be to me as you have said that the angel left her. Such a simple statement. I am the Lord's servant. That is the proper response of any of us when we are contemplating the will of God. You know, we're not the one in charge. And frankly, we shouldn't be. If God needs to bless me in order for his will to be done, then so be it. If God needs to lower me so that his will can be done, then so be it. You see, the will of God is the good of the world. The will of God is the reconciliation of humanity with its creator. And the will of God is ultimately the end of sin and death. In light of such a divine will, we all should be ready to say, I am the Lord's servant. So now we have the stage set, our first two messages. We have two miraculous sons that have been promised, two who are on the way. Indeed, the advent of God is at hand.